Welcome to the Unity Guides Expert Interview Series. My name is Clayton Stenson, and I'll be your host today. This series is brought to you by Unity Guides Incorporated, where we help develop unity within companies running on the entrepreneurial operating system. We do this through fractional integrator services and relationship coaching for the visionary and integrator. And the reason I started this interview series is that I've met some pretty amazing people in recent years, and the conversations we've had have been valuable to me. So I thought I should share them with other people to add value to them as well. And today's guest is Nick Soller. Nick is a fractional COO and business advisor in South Dakota. Welcome, Nick. Oh, thanks, Clayton. Appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. A great deal of respect for you. And I know you've got lots to, lots to share. So today we're going to talk about hiring your weakness and getting out of the way. So tell us a little bit about why you wanted that to do that topic today. Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, I think in business across the board, there's uh, a passion for, for people to go into business because they're good at something. And they don't realize that because they're good at something that doesn't necessarily make them good at business. And yeah. the numbers kind of bear that out because of the fact that like, you know, here in the States, 90% of startups fail and 60% of that 90% uh, fail in the first five years. So the numbers are definitely stacked against people trying to start a company. And, you know, whether they're good at, you know, uh, construction framing or whether they're good at healthcare or anything else, it, it's not necessarily a golden ticket to be uh, great at being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And when you said that, I immediately thought of all the trades people that I know, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> my background's construction. You know, so there's tons of trades people, they get, you know, the journeyman ticket or the red seal or whatever. And then they, they're like frustrated with their boss. And it's like, wow, I'm going to start my own business. I can do it better than them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they get into it and they're like, wow, this kind of sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's a different, it, like you say, it is a different, it is a different skill set um, than, uh, than just being on tools. So absolutely. So you work a lot with physiotherapists and in, in that world. So tell us a little bit more about how that applies in that context. Yeah, it's interesting. So I work with, uh, I've worked with a spectrum, everything from uh, physicians to physiotherapists or physical therapists here in the States, speech, occupational therapists, even on to like med spas and fitness facilities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the people that are in these different professions, they have a huge heart for wanting to see people achieve optimum health, whether the person has had some sort of malady and they're trying to restore that health or whether they're like not anything major that's wrong. They just want to be in better health. All these mm -hmm. people got in it because they have a big heart to help. But the interesting thing to me is, is that in this, these set of professions alone, I just heard this in the last few weeks, somebody shared with me that three out of four healthcare providers do not have the psychological makeup to be successful in business. And so you've got all these startup statistics. And then on top of that, you have a complex business model, which has to have a whole lot of uh, HIPAA and, you know, uh, various different risk compliance issues and stuff like that. And then you have three out of four people that don't have the psychology to be a business owner. And so at, that gets really expensive quickly if you're trying to learn on the fly and if you don't want to learn, then you're doomed to failure, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And they, you know, I wonder in, and I'm not educated as a, any of those things, <laughs> right? But I, I'm, I'm sure likely they don't teach about business when you go to school for that. Yeah, you're so spot on. And this conversation literally just happened this week. I was sitting down with a nurse practitioner that owns a med spa. And so... Uh, the individual, amazing individual, put herself through school, had two kids during the process, single mom, all these amazing things and like tremendous like stick to itness to do it. And so now she's got this practice and she's smart because she's looking for help. She, she knows that she's got a blind spot when it comes to business. And I said to her, I said, I don't, I've never met anybody who has had business training in their healthcare schooling. And she's like, yeah, absolutely. I talk to people all the time. They have no idea where to start. And then they get into this and they're just kind of, you know, a, a boat out in the water without any direction of which way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you either slug it out and learn the hard way, <laughs> right, <laughs> over years. And if you survive, maybe you figure it out. Um, or what? Do you, what's the other option? Uh, I think that, you know, forward thinking people in the health and fitness industry that realize that they don't have formal business training do a few things. Um, some will try to go at it on their own, but they'll also teach themselves along the way because they realize they have a blind spot. 
Yeah. Uh, the advent of AI, it's been fascinating to me because of the fact that you can create quite a bit of business planning and knowledge in a very short period of time via AI. Yeah. And then I think people that are looking for a more custom solution, they bring someone in alongside them that maybe has business background and also understands uh, healthcare and fitness at a deep level so that they can understand the operations and finances and the compliance issues and everything else that go along with it. So you, you essentially hire your weakness. Some people do it at a knowledge level, some do it at a tech level, and some people do it with someone else who's walked the path. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I was at the US conference last week, and I was amazed. Um, all the keynote speakers talked about vulnerability mm -hmm. and understanding your strengths and weaknesses and, you know, all these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, and I've seen it too in almost everyone. Well, no, everyone that I know that's successful in business is self-aware, right. And has done what you're just saying, hire your weakness. Um, and I immediately think of the visionary integrator <laughs> duo, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's the same thing, right? You don't have to be good at everything, right? As long as you can surround yourself with people that can do the things you can't do. Um, so what was your journey like to, to discover this kind of thing um, in your own life? Sorry, that's kind of a <laughs> deeper question, but. It's a great question. Um, I was, I was fortunate. So I started working with my dad when I was 11 and that was just to kind of help him out. He was working in some really dangerous areas. And so I was a pretty big kid and, and taller than him and, and, you know, seventh, eighth grade. So I went with him kind of as unofficial, like backup and protection or run to get help if things went sideways. But I also learned how to work with my hands. And I did that uh, all the way through my teen years and started my first business when I was 15, used that to pay my way through college and grad school went to PT school. And then um, on my last clinical, somebody found out that I had a business background. And so my first offer out of PT school was to take a clinic in a rural town that was not profitable. And so implemented some some practices to make that profitable in four months. And then that same year, another opportunity, same thing they had heard about, you know, business background stuff. And so they said, we've got, you know, some clinics in the South that are, you know, just weeks from closing. And if you can help, they'll you know, be ownership in it for you. So kind of work in buyout type opportunity. And so went down there and, and you know, 30 days was cash flow positive in a year. It was a, a million dollar plus company going from closing to, you know, a million in a year during the Great Recession is a kind of an exciting thing for a company that's, you know, a small company you don't want to close. But uh, just over time, it's just been kind of, you know, one of those things after another that has just been fortunate to fall on my path along the way and some good things have come out of it. Yeah. So are you have you experienced the same thing about self-awareness and vulnerability and that kind of thing in your walk with working with people? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. For me, early on, it was painful because of the fact that I wasn't self-aware in the respect of having like patience. Like it was obvious to me how to make the business successful. And you know, if I'm working alongside someone, if if they were the visionary that started the business, I was like, you know, I wouldn't say it out loud. Why don't you get this? But in my head, I'm like, why is this not moving faster? <laughs> and it was really my own limitations to learn how to just to interact in a way that was productive rather than just like, hey, we need to do this. And uh, yeah. over time, what has happened is, is that I've realized that in healthcare, and I think it's another business too, but you know, I do a lot with healthcare these days is, is that um, there's a, there's a condition when people have a certain type of stroke where they don't realize they have a second half of their body. And so if you're not in healthcare or you haven't experienced this in real time, you just can't wrap your head around what it's like. But to these people that have had this particular type of stroke, they literally cannot see one half of their body. They look in the mirror and they only see one half. Hmm. And so what happens is they don't know what that other hand's doing. And I think that that's the way it is in businesses is that someone is very aware of the one side, especially like in healthcare, it's I'm going to be the greatest caregiver ever, but then the business suffers accordingly. And so there is a subset of owners that go, man, I don't want to have to go back and learn business. So I'm just going to find someone who knows about business, who also knows about healthcare. Those people are very self-aware visionaries. And then they're looking for that integrator piece. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was hired by my, well, actually I'll go back even further. My first visionary, I was very much like you, right? I was like, I, I call it a flaming integrator. I wasn't an integrator, but I call it a flaming integrator where I was just like, you know, what's wrong with you? Like, why can't you see this? Right? Like, like, we need to do this. And but he was, he was very much a flaming visionary, 
who was also saying the exact same things. What's wrong with you? That won't work. Like, what do you, you know what I mean? And we just, we sort of kind of worked okay together, but you know, neither of us were, I don't think like emotionally, uh, or, you know, aware and self-aware and comfortable to yeah. challenge each other and accept each other. Then I moved to my next visionary and, uh, when he hired me as estimator, he's like, I hate spreadsheets and I don't want to learn them. <laughs> right. So very aware, right. Of, of, of what he's good at and what he's not good at. And then when he promoted me integrator, he said, when I touch ops, it blows up in my face. So wow. I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Like, you know, he, he was kind of like, I just, I just don't care about the emotional side of people. Right? <laughs> like, so I just tell it like it is. And, and then they get offended and, you know, but you're better at that. So you go do that. And then he went and bought another business, right? Oh. And he did something else. And he said, like, you just kind of run with this one. Let me know if you need anything. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it worked, right? Because sure. he let go and I was capable and he trusted me. Right? Well, you had the experience of learning like from past interactions and stuff like things that you need to work on to become a better integrator he realized that he could turn it over to you and he realized that's not his strength where he admitted it out loud, which is pretty cool. And then yeah. busy himself with something else. So he wouldn't get caught up in the, in the mix of things and then left it to you to, to make it successful. So. Yeah. And he went and bought another company that was kind of like the ones you're describing that were almost bankrupt, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he made the hard decisions that needed to be made in order to turn it around, like yeah. laying people off breaking the lease, you know, like all those things that I think only a visionary can do that stuff, right? Like not, not, it's not totally true, but a visionary because of their lack of emotion sometimes can just do hard things easier, right? That's, that's really and, well put. And that company is, um, you know, more profitable than the one that I was helping him with now, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's done really well, but at some point he needed to also pass that over someone else to run so anyway um yeah self-awareness and vulnerability and that i think is extremely crucial because if you you know i'm sure if someone's listening to this and they're like hire your weakness and get out of the way like it's easy to say yeah. <laughs> very easy to say but what advice do you have for somebody who's like yeah i need to do that but scares the crap out of me <laughs> what advice would you have that's a great question i Personally, this is my opinion. I don't know that this is the end all be all strategy, but I think that if people ask themselves the question, like, how's this working out for me? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of people that own a job and don't have a business. Like mm -hmm. they, and like to your point, like you mentioned earlier on, there's, there's folks in the trade and every other profession that go, I can do it better than my boss can do it. I'm just going to start my own company. Yep. What they start is self-employment in the trades that are in construction, but they're only them in healthcare. They're a physician and they're delivering healthcare, but it's only that physician and with maybe like one office staff. But here's the thing is, is that if that person leaves for two weeks or two months, profits tank just off a cliff type of thing. That's not a business. You own your job and it's self-employment. And there, that often gets muddied between the two. So what I try to do, especially with folks that maybe don't realize how big their blind spot is, is ask them the question. And I try to do it in the kindest way possible mm -hmm. after establishing a strong relationship is say, you know, you don't have to answer this right now. And if you do, that's great. But take this back and think about it. How is it currently working out for you? Do you feel like your organization is at its best level possible? Or do you feel like there's tons of more room for growth and you don't know how to get there? And I think that if they're allowed to come to the decision on their own, most often cases, it turns out better than if you put them on the spot and really kind of drill into them. Yeah. A, a lot of folks will recoil from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And then, you know, when you said that another thing came to mind, like a lot, I think a lot of people think, you know, one day I'll, I'll sell my company and that'll be my retirement plan. And um, that's a pipe dream. If you're, if your business is a job, right? Like your, your business isn't worth anything, right? If it's all around you, right? So true. just so, had that conversation within the last few weeks, that individual, they're the, the sole deliverer of services right now and stuff like that. Very interested in selling their business in the future. 
and very kindly said to him, like, you know, I'm not trying to be abrasive, but here's the thing is, is that if you sell your business, then someone is just essentially buying clients and they may just shelve that, but they're going to get, they're going to offer you the lowest possible dollar rather than if you had systems built in place and the business was able to run and you were able to walk away for two months at a time and go on sabbatical, that's mm -hmm. a business. And then they can build, buy your systems and replicate it. And that's a good place to be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like. I know darn well that I can't sell my business right now. It's not worth anything. Yeah. Right. You know, but you know, I'm doing things that will make it worth something like YouTube channel and, you know, course content and, you know, write a book and, you know, those kinds of things will help. But, you know, at some point, and I'm, I've got a small team and, you know, but the reality is I couldn't sell it right now. It's not, it's not worth anything. It is, it is a job um, currently, but, you know, but I know that. Right. You're smart and you're building systems and frameworks. And the other thing that I admire about what you're doing, Clayton, is, is that all of your different enterprise functions are not named after you. And that's a thing that's often overlooked is, is that a lot of the small time uh, folks that start off on something, they put myself included, like I currently have two businesses, uh, separate businesses that have Salar as the first word in the business. Over mm -hmm. the next year, I'm going to be changing those names because as these build bigger and stuff like that, to what you're doing is, is all your businesses are named, not Stenson or Clayton or anything like that. So that way, when someone buys it, they're not buying a name, they're buying a business that stands alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm following your lead and, and taking my name out of the equation so that the businesses can grow before purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so what other advice do you have for, for people that are on this journey? Ooh, I, here, this is a good one. Um, so I'm listening to a book right now and, uh, it's called all in by Mike McCallowitz. He's one of my favorite authors. He's oh, that's his new one, right? Yeah. I haven't, I haven't read that one yet. It's, it's so cool. He's, so he's, he's essentially talking about like hiring and culture and stuff like that mm -hmm. in Colorado, several years back, I did a turnaround for a hospital business unit that had never seen a profit in its entire existence of 70 plus years. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a pretty tall order when the CEO says, I don't even think it can be profitable. Like, just do the best you can. I'm like, challenge accepted. So what we did is, is we created from scratch a cultural turnaround, and then we hired really good people, and then we paid them above market rates. And all of a sudden, a profit was turned in 26 months. And so that's the setup to this book all in, because Mike McCallowitz is kind of talking about the different pieces to really bring exceptional people into your organization. But what stood out to me is um, one of the founders of uh, the container store, Kip Tendall, uh, and the container store is pretty fascinating enterprise in and of itself. Mike McCallowitz happened to just sit down for lunch at a conference with Kip Tendall. And so they were kind of chatting back and forth and stuff. And Kip said, "We hire, he, Mike goes, how in the world can you pay above market rates and not sink your company? And so Kip Tendall says, well, we pay one and a half what the market rate is. So he's like, well, if Walmart sells containers and they pay 20 bucks an hour, we pay 35 bucks an hour. And Mike McKellis is like, what? How do you pay that much? And he goes, well, here's the deal. If you have A players and you only bring in A players, they do about three times the work of a typical B player. So you have to hire three B players and each B player, you're paying 20 bucks an hour. So that's 60 bucks on the aggregate. And he goes, yeah. if you're hiring C players, which B and C is what Walmart hires, he's like, it takes nine C players. So nine times 20 is 180 bucks an hour. We're paying 35 bucks an hour. So we're getting a deal and we have better people who stay longer with less turnover. Wow. And so to that point and kind of to, to back out to the macro level with the Colorado situation was we hired just like the uh, most amazing people in healthcare that you could find. First and foremost, great people with core values that were a match for what we were trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That plus a, a above market pay rate is what led to being able to turn a profit for the first time in 70 years with some other stuff like Mm -hmm. Yeah, solutions and things. But I think it, on the aggregate, and Craig Rochelle will talk about this, he says it takes on the average about two years to do a cultural turnaround. That's what needed to happen with that particular situation because of the fact that 70 years, I mean, nothing had changed. And here we are, we did a cultural turnaround 26 months and the result was a profit. So yeah, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love Mike McCallowitz. I got to get that one. <laughs> <laughs> he's so much fun to listen to. Like he, <laughs> Yeah, you laugh and engage the whole time. <laughs> There's a few things in there that you said that were that were good that kind of prompted me. Um, I'm sure to decide which one <laughs> to go. <laughs> but 
Uh, yeah, you know, hiring A players. Yeah, that's huge. I've never heard those numbers before, though. That's 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 interesting. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say, um, I've heard people say that hiring an operations manager pays for itself more than pays for itself. I don't I don't know if it's true, right? Mm -hmm. But like hiring a good one, right? Because of the efficiency and you know that kind of thing. So so first time that I was an integrator, we were not profitable either. Um, I was permanent into that role. We you know, started implementing EOS, self-implementing EOS. And in 12 months, we 22 times our net, net profit. Great, right? that's awesome. But, you know, for me, like, it's, it's interesting because for me, it was like, none of this is hard, right? Like none of this is like, this, is, this isn't rocket science. Like I read a book and I started implementing it, but the, the reality is someone that's well-suited for this type of work, it's just, it feels more natural right for them but for a visionary you know if i try to do this it'll blow up on my face yeah right yeah. and that's that's what you're talking about hire your weakness mm -hmm. and get out of the way and the get out of the way part is the hard part and i think the reason it worked so well in that company was because he did he he left like they they talk about in eos that one of the hardest things for a visionary to do is let go of the vine right and allow someone else to run with it and he did he just literally left <laughs> right he's like he's like let me know if you need anything <laughs> right and not every situation is like that obviously we knew each other for 10 years we had the, we were part of the same church you know he'd seen me uh in my previous role and trusted me right so it's a little bit of a unique situation but um yeah to but what, so go ahead oh i didn't mean to interrupt you i just want to say oh, to your point like i was sitting down to lunch yesterday with a business partner i'm a a co-founder of a third business and it's called relationship sales. The, yeah. the guy who dreamed up the curriculum for this, he's a 30 year career sales professional and he is full on visionary. Like I would say if anybody could be a hundred percent visionary, it's, it's him. And so with that, he's a hard charger. And uh, so what he does realize though, is, is that he's hiring his weakness. And so when he asked me to lunch the very first time, he goes, look, here's the deal. I don't want anything to do with operations and finance and tech and everything else. He's like, I feel like you're the guy, like, you know, so we have this really symbiotic relationship for this partnership. And so um, what I found is, is that it works amazingly well because of the fact that he just is ready to take the next step with the next piece of the curriculum and building it out so people can have this amazing opportunity. And he doesn't have any interest in the day to day. And to that point, Craig Rochelle experienced the same situation because to, you said they don't want to let go of the vine. I thought that was a really good you know, kind of picture of what it's like. So Craig mm -hmm. Rochelle is starting Life Church and he's into it. And Jerry Hurley comes on board and Jerry is kind of his second. And so Jerry was a, uh, a, I think a district sales manager at Target and very talented, highly paid, you know, very accomplished. Um, and so he comes into to Life Church and and so Craig Rochelle is the bottleneck on the organization. So Jerry, Jerry Hurley goes, hey, can I carry your Bible and your stand to our next meeting while we're walking? Craig goes, oh, that's really nice. This guy that I look up to who's a few years older and more accomplished wants to carry my stuff. And so he does. And he and so Jerry's carrying his stand in his Bible. And he says, do you mind if I share something with you? And Craig goes, yeah, sure. He goes, look, here's the deal. If you don't allow a release of control of the organization, you'll continue to be the bottleneck on top of it. And I think that that's the holding on of the vine that really kind of zaps a lot of organizations. You are the, you know, kind of, hey, I'll take care and tend to the vine type person uh, and integrators are, and, you know, just kind of the bigger picture of integration versus visionaries, they want to hold on tight. And when they realize it's okay to let go, the organization flourishes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's challenging, right? It, it is, it's, it's your, it's your baby, mm -hmm. right? If you were the founder and you built it from nothing, uh, you know, and, and I've, I've done other episodes specifically on this topic, so I won't go too deep into this, but it, it can become your identity. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you can, you can get your value from it. Right. Yep. Like, and so if your all your value comes from your company and your contribution to it and the amount that people need you, right. It's very hard to let go of that. Cause that's who you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's your DNA. <laughs> yeah, it can be right. And, mm -hmm. I, and I've, I've, I know that because I've experienced it. I've, I've, been in that tension right of trying to help someone let go um and uh and i think again that's why that self-development and growth is really important 
right? And and for you and I, like we're people of faith and my value doesn't come, right? From my being an integrator, right? Yeah. Or my business, it comes from my relationship with God, right? So I don't, I don't struggle with that stuff anymore, but I used to, yeah. right? I, I used to struggle with that. Uh, I remember when I was in high school, I struggled with that, you know, because uh, I was a basketball player and everybody knew me as the basketball guy. And then I stopped playing basketball and now it's like, well, who am I? <laughs> right. And then I was a pastor for years. And when I stopped being a pastor, it was like, okay, well, now I'm not a pastor. Who, what am I? Who am I? Right. And, and, you know, it, it was, it was good because it, it helped me to break, break free of that and start putting my value where, it, where it truly belongs. If you're, if you're curious more about that, watch uh, the one with Benj Miller. It was really good because he talked about that and he wrote a great book about it. Um, but, um, but yeah, you, you need to, you need to be okay to, to let go. And, and, and in that when he talks about um, finding your, val, you know, finding more, va more value in legacy, mm -hmm. right. Than in your identity, right. Yeah. It's like, how can I raise people up? How can I, you know, develop people shift, shift from, from, uh, you know, it all being about you, but to more so like, how do I build a business that has an impact on others, uh, even within your organization? So more yeah. about the seeds that you plant than the the title or the association that that people yeah. on you. So yeah. and to your point, Clayton, I just want to go back to this because I think that, you know, it was yeah. a really good conversation we've had so far. But you know, talking about maybe this episode will be called blind spots or or you know, something like that. But um you had talked about like, you know, sometimes visionaries can't see their blind spots. Sometimes you and I couldn't see our blind spots. Yeah. Like, why is this not second nature? I think on the whole, like it doesn't matter whether you're a visionary integrator anywhere in the organization, like people historically are not good at realizing their blind spots. And it's the people that are open to hearing from other people that have established trusts mm -hmm. and, and say, look, do you mind if I share this with you? Or would you permit me to share something with you that I've observed? Mm -hmm. Like in the integrator seat, like we don't, sometimes we don't realize that it's second nature as from an integration standpoint that, oh, this just makes sense. This is how a business becomes successful to other mm -hmm. people it's not as readily apparent to them from the visionary seat, same thing. Like they have blind spots as well. Mm -hmm. Back to my business partner, I said to him, I said, what is second nature to you in sales is like another planet for people who have yeah. never, ever had sales. Exactly. It's yeah. just completely foreign to them. And he's like, that's a really good point. He goes, and he said this yesterday and it was a really nice compliment. I took it very well. And, and he said, um, he goes, you know, you've been really good because of the fact that you didn't have sales training before we met. He said, you've been really good at pointing out things that like, I just think, oh gosh, that, why wouldn't we do that? Doesn't everybody know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that, you know, it's neat that the the visionary and integrator relationship allows uh, for some of that to be able to kind of mention it to the other person in a kind way. Yeah, it's absolutely crucial. Um, I think it's the most important part of it all, yeah. right? Is Is having a, a relationship that's strong enough that you can do that yeah. with each other. And this conversation is actually making me realize my current client, like there's some things that we need to talk about, right? Like <laughs> there's a, there's a bottleneck happening um, that, that needs to be addressed. And, you know, it's not his fault. Actually, I think it's a combination of our faults. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it is extremely important. And then the first visionary I worked with pre EOS, I wasn't that I couldn't do that for him. You know, and, and later I start because I was intimidated and scared to, to say what needed to be said. Yeah. Um, but I know that I did not serve him well. Hmm. Because I didn't, you know, point those things out. And now I'm much quicker to do that. Right. It's like, you know, and, and but it, like you said, in a nice way, it's like, hey, you know what? I noticed this, yep. and then I noticed that the team did this mm -hmm. in response to what you did, and you complain about this, <laughs> right? But I think what you did is actually creating that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and if you can, and and then what do you think? You know, and usually when I explain, it's like, oh, geez. <laughs> right i think you might i think you might be right and but you know we don't we don't serve each other by not you know not sharpening each other and challenging each other right like that's crucial crucial um 
but in love. And Justin Moss, the, the MC and the closing speaker at the US conference, he said, you have to be okay to be stabbed in the front. Wow, that's a profound, st- I mean, it, that's it's how true. You put it. Not stabbed in the back. Stabbed in the back's not good. Nobody wants to be stabbed in the back, but you have to be willing to be, you know, like, oh, that yeah. hurt, <laughs> right? That's but, a great picture. And, you know, it's going to take me a minute, <laughs> right? Like you said, you don't have to answer right now, mm-hmm. right? But think about it. Um, and then, you know, but like, oh, yeah, that hurts a bit. But, you know, and a husband and wife, it's just, it's similar, right? Like we, we, yeah. cha- we challenge each other. We see each other's worst, ugliest parts, right? We, we see the triggers. We see the bad days, you know, we see all that stuff. And, uh, and it's crucial, but it's crucial that, you know, if we want to grow, if we want to be the best version of who we are, we yeah. need people close enough to be able to challenge. So we're kind you of have getting... time for a fun story along those lines. Yeah, about. <laughs> So all of this, like, so I would have been stuck where the original part of our conversation was today. And we were talking about how, like, I I couldn't figure out how to share this with someone in a way that they would not, like, not <laughs> recoil against it. So Lindsay, yeah, and I I are early on, <laughs> right. so Lindsay and I are early on in marriage and I, like, I'm trying to because <laughs> they're two weeks from closing and like, I'm up all night, like my brain's cooling down from trying to help fix these clinics. I'm up until two, three in the morning and stuff. And I'm playing this game and this game is ding, 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 making this sound. That's really quiet. I didn't think she could hear it. She wakes up and goes, if I hear one more ding, 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 I'm going to take your phone away. And I thought she was joking because she's always kind about everything. So I said, I, I laughed and she's like, no, I'm serious. Like you're going to have a heart attack because you're up all night long. And she's like, why don't you read again? And I'm like, oh no. I said, I'm not going to read. I said, I'm a slow reader. I don't, I've read enough in school for a lifetime. And she goes, well, why don't you just take, do audiobooks if you don't like to read? And I couldn't argue with that. And that was the journey that set off professional development to like make it so that it would be more interactional rather than why don't you get this? Right. So the the credit goes to Lindsay, but she had to say it in a way that like, I, she had to overcome my objections and she did it in a kind way, but still kind of gently, you know, kind of wafted across my face. Like, Hey, you probably need to start professional development. So yeah, that's good. That's a great, great story. Uh, It reminds me of our, so when I first came to the church that I worked at, um, we had an amazing, like kind of second in command executive pastor and, and I didn't know him that well. And then he unfortunately died from brain tumor, but he, uh, I was always told by people that he had this incredible ability to correct you and you not really realize that he did it until like, you know, the next day or later that day. <laughs> <laughs> Like he would, he would, he just had this incredible ability, just, you know, like say it in such a loving way that, and in, in our unarguable way. And then, and then, uh, you know, later you're like, you know, what? <laughs> he just corrected me, right? Like he just coached me and challenged me on something and I didn't even notice. Right. <laughs> and that's, you know, like I said, I didn't know him very well, but I was always like, man, I need to, I need to learn and how to do that. Right. That's uh, a gift. I think part of it is caring like just genuinely caring. And I think in your sales coaching, I'm, I imagine, uh, and I, I don't know this for fact, but I think, you know, the best way to be a great salesperson is, is to genuinely care and just want to help people. 100%. Right? Well and I think it's the same thing in leadership. If you genuinely care and want to help people and they know it and can feel it, you can say a lot of stuff that people, other people will be like, I can't believe you just said that. And they took it, right? Like, and received it. Um, yeah so that's great marriage too <laughs> what are we talking about today <laughs> <Five spots. laughs> but but that's what it is right hire your weakness get out of the way if you have a blind spot you don't know you have it you don't know you have a weakness well to your point i think and and you know just kind of tie things together like the companies that there's someone at the head that refuses to admit or to realize they have a blind spot they don't hire their weaknesses. And that's probably what leads to these ridiculous statistics of nine out of 10 businesses fail and six out of 10 in the first five years and so on and so forth. Like knowing your blind spots coming together for the strength of the duo is what makes the difference. Yeah. I've got a funny story that's related to this too. I hired a bookkeeper back in January and Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I'm a reasonably detailed person. I'm an integrator, right? But (laughs) She's been fixed. She was fixing my books, right? This is the vulnerability part, right? She's fixing my books from last year and 
and we met when she, she was pretty much done and we met and she's like um Clayton <laughs> you're not you're not very good <laughs> <Quick books. laughs> I'm like what do you mean she's like yeah how about you just do the invoicing and that's it <laughs> and I'm like what do you mean she's like yeah it, it, you just did a whole lot a lot of things wrong and I'm like okay <laughs> I'm cool with that <laughs> right like, uh, but I'm doing the invoicing right she's like yeah you're doing the invoicing right but that's all you're allowed to do <laughs> now. And, and I'm like wow this is cool I feel like I'm a visionary now <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like I'm kind of having a leash put on me you know to yeah. not do certain things but but I embraced it. It's like, okay, I, I don't enjoy it. I don't really want to do it. I'm not good at it. All I care about is that the numbers are right. So fine. Sounds good. You do it. Right. <laughs> but that's another blind spot conversation. She had to have the courage, right. To challenge me and, and, and to say that. And I could tell it was awkward, but she's probably, it's not probably the first time she said that conversation people <laughs> well she's cared enough to speak up so obviously she uh believes in her craft quite a bit rather than trying to just gloss over it so she doesn't lose a client yeah and and, uh, and i trust her right like that's that's the difference you know i've known her for a few years and i trust her and i was like okay you know i get it and i i believe you <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's it's not like i could learn how to i and here's here's the probably the gold here i could learn how to do quick quickbooks and do it really well I have no doubt that yeah. I could learn that, right? But is it worth your time and effort versus having an expert who can do it effortlessly and then you are freed up to do more of the three most valuable things that you do every day professionally? Yeah, absolutely. No, like I can't hire anybody to do these interviews, Yeah, right? I can't hire anybody to do the fractional integrator work. I can't hire, well, I, I, I could, right? But I don't want to <laughs> right now, right? Like I, I got three little boys and, you know, like I've also got that going on, right? And so, you know, you have to pick your spots. You can't do everything uh, or you'll, you know, you'll bottleneck or fail. Well said. Like, just, point. just reality. And I've hired a couple other people as well this year, you know, doing, you know, doing administrative, you know, detail stuff that really I shouldn't be doing right? There's no way I should be doing it. It just doesn't make sense for the business. Um, but I think we, we hold on to it all. Like I want to do it all or I can't afford to, I can't afford to pay somebody 50 bucks an hour to do my, my books. I've called right? self-employment when you hold on to it for too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, awesome. Um, any other, any other, uh, thoughts or comments you want to make before we wrap up? Hmm. I can't think of anything. I really, you know, appreciate the opportunity to to be on the the show today. And I guess the only thing I would say is is that for anybody listening in, don't hire for experience. And Mike talks about this in the book, but it's it's been something that I've been passionate about for longer. Don't hire for experience. That can be something that's trained. Hire for core values first and foremost. And you know, it you may already be aware of this as what we do, but basically like uh, Jim Collins from Good to Great talks about that values driven organizations outperform the market and their competitors by some crazy number like 16 to 1 and 5 to 1 respectively or something like that. And businesses are always looking for an edge. That's an edge right there is just create your business based on core values and hire for core values. And that is a game changer. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the takeaway component is, is know your core values and your blind spots. That's good. Yeah. And I know myself working fractionally, and I've only been doing it for two or three years, but you know, my first fractional client, I did not put enough attention on that, yeah. you know, like on the, the core value side, like the culture side, the values match, you know, that side of things. It didn't go well, uh, which wasn't great, but I learned from it. And now since then I've done, I've been a lot more intentional, right. To dig into who this person is and whether they're a good uh, values match for who I am. And yeah, it's been a game changer. So, That's good. Really good. good. Awesome. So if someone wants to learn more about you and what you do, how should they get in touch, Nick? Yeah, sure. So uh, I purse uh, on purpose, I don't advertise. So if you want to find me, you can find me at, at Nicholas J. Saller on LinkedIn. If you want to strike up a conversation to learn more, there's uh, obviously ways on there to reach out. And then there's also, uh, you know, podcasts and, and videos and stuff uh, based on around the things that I do. So that's the way to reach me if you want to get in touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just say, of all the people I've met in my life, 
Uh, Nick is one of the most caring kind of people that Thanks. I've ever met. And he will, he will help you whether you, you know, he will, if you meet with him, he will add value and he will help you on your journey. Uh, and he won't ever try to sell you. And, um, you know, like, cause he can, he just generally cares. So that would be my advice. Meet with Nick. He's great. And, Appreciate uh, it. On behalf of our viewers, just want to thank you. It was fun. Uh, we we kind of went a little all over the place, but I think it, we all it all was relevant. <laughs> to the topic. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your passion, and I'm sure it'll be impactful for people on their journey. Uh, so, if today's interview added value to you, please subscribe to this channel for future interviews with experts in the world of business. Mm -hmm.